Welcome to the podcast that unveils the future of investing. In each episode, we explore asset classes, trends and technologies with founders, investors and experts involved into shaping that future. Today, your host George Alifura speaks to Ramon Recuero, the founder of Babylon Finance, a new type of decentralized investment platform that allows people to build wealth together. Hey everyone, this is George. I'm particularly excited to share this conversation with Ramon from Babylon Finance with you as it's the first time we go deep into DeFi and DAOs. Just a quick note, the conversation was recorded a couple of weeks ago when Babylon was in private beta and it's now live. Also, I had some technical issues, so I had to re-record my voice. So if it sounds a little bit unnatural, it's because of that, but that shouldn't distract you from the very interesting things that Ramon will share with us. Enjoy this conversation. Ramon, GM, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, George. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to explore decentralized investing. But first, I'd be really keen to hear about your background and what you did before Babylon. I'm originally from Spain in Europe. I've been in the U.S. now for 12, 13 years. And I've been working since I graduated. I had my own startup in the gaming space. And then I worked for a variety of startups and tech companies in the West Coast, like Zynga, Y Combinator, Google. Um, but for the last six, seven years, I can only th- think about crypto because once you go through the rabbit hole, there is no way back. So uh, for all that time, all my friends were always asking me what to do with crypto because they knew me as the crypto guy from our friend group. So then I was constantly getting questions like, oh, should I invest in Cardano? Should I now it's a good moment to buy Bitcoin and Ethereum? Eventually it got tiring. So then that's why I set up like a simple smart contract. I set up a Telegram group with, with my friends and told them, okay, you can, if you want, you can deposit money here in this smart contract. And then we will manage it together through Telegram group. Then it worked really well. And then it's okay. How do we take this to the next level and not only to people that know me so they can get advantage of this. And this is how Babylon got started. Here, I have to add for full disclosure that I am an early user of Babylon and I fully understand how it grew organically, but how would you describe it to outsiders? Yeah, Babylon is a protocol uh, that allows people to create their own investment clubs uh, and then invest together in a specific vertical within DeFi. So for example, we have clubs where people that are uh, risk averse that want to, let's say, accumulate Ether and they just want to deposit Ether and then stake it and generate a passive return. And then we have other investment clubs where people just want as much alpha as possible, taking risk, taking leverage. So we have also several investment clubs that we call them gardens in honor of the gardens of Babylon to, to the idea is like every garden, every investment club has a different risk preference, different liquidity preference, and different time preferences. Some of them are short term, some of them are medium term, some of them are long term. But all of them, our goal is to turn uh, investing from a kind of single pl- player approach, like you can do on, on Fidelity or Vanguard, uh, turn it more into a multiplayer experience. It's kind of like a bit what Wall Street bets also went into that area, but from a different angle. Let's start with a superficial look at Babylon, leaving the investment side for later. When you arrive on the website, you discover a universe with gardens, hearts, and a distinctive look. It's a beautiful site. It's an immersive experience. How did you go about building it? Thank you. Yeah, there are several things on back there. One of them is, I mean, one of the reasons for starting Babylon is to help everyone compound wealth and accumulate wealth. And I think in general, education everywhere does a really bad deal about this. And one of the best books in personal finance is called The Richest Man in Babylon. So that was like one of the, <laughs> one of the references and for the idea is basically to let people invest in, in a place that is gonna, is gonna just compound their wealth because one of the other, one of the other sources of the idea is that there is almost no growth to be had in traditional asset classes. You know, traditionally you have the 60, 40 portfolio where you allocate 60% to stocks and 40% to bonds. Uh, then you also have some real estate, you have some volatility component to, and you create your whole portfolio based on that. I think at the moment we are right now, if you look at, for example, at bonds in the last 30 years, they are all down. So it's bonds are not a great place to hide anymore because there is not so much room 
And then stocks are at one of the highest mm -hmm. price to earnings ratio. So you can say they are quite overvalued, especially in the US or the main markets. Real estate, same thing in the US and in some pockets, so that you can always find alpha if you know how to pick it. But I think crypto uh, and digital assets is the place where it's going to be like a hundred X growth in the next two decades. So it's how we can, how we help investors capture this growth in this asset class through, through this community investing. How has your gaming experience influenced the project? No, uh, this is a great question. Gaming, my experience at Singa and then at my own company is great because you learn. And especially my first company was also user generated games focus on trivia. So where people could create, uh, for example, a game out there of the rings and ask questions about which character dies here or which characters appear in the scene and things like that. But then you realize that the, for example, things like the funnel, the user experience are really important because, or how long does the page take to load? Because, you know, the drop off is quite considerable, considerable. If you take one second versus you take five seconds. So. Uh, we spent a lot of time getting the user experience right, because I believe most crypto projects suck at this and they don't need to focus on this, uh, to be honest, because uh, the DeFi hardcore user doesn't care about this and is willing to go through the pain to get the alpha. So it doesn't even matter. It's even a meme that the user experiences are as bad as they are. But in our case, we want to bring people that are a bit farther the curve. For example, people that are, they just have an account on Coinbase. And maybe they just set up their account in MetaMask, but they don't know anything else. So these people have a lower pain threshold. So our UI needs to be better because we are using uh, this investment class as a way to, to acquire and get new people into this DeFi world. Uh, it needs to be as friendly as possible because then one person can create an investment club and that person can get 100 new people onto crypto. So you only need one expert and then that expert can bring 100 people along. And user experience and user interface is such an important topic for fintech in general. Now, we've spoken about the investment clubs and asset management, and those are concepts that are useful because we immediately understand what we're talking about. Yet, I think this is not just about transposing what we know into DeFi. It's about first principle and something original and different, right? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. From my Personal experience, I think most people have it really difficult to start investing in crypto or start getting into the space for many different reasons. One of them is, how to say, high fees. Another one is they don't know how to get started. There is so much information out there and not a single person can keep up with what's going on. Only just in DeFi, then you got NFTs, you have other stuff. So it's 24 seven job and for different people. This is a new technology. What crypto and Ethereum and blockchain has given us is this new trust platform that then unlocks a new set of capabilities. So there is no reason why we should port traditional mental models of asset management, like the 220, you know, the 220 funds, uh, fees that the hedge funds use. There is no reason why we should port all those things without thinking about it. So from us, we have uh, created this asset management platform, trying to reinvent as much as we can from our first principle platform. So the benefits for the user, uh, a, a few. One of them is uh, obvious that is the gas fees. For example, if you want to, let's say you want to go into curve and then deposit some stables to, so you earn some of the mine, some of the liquidity fees and the trading fees. And then you want to stake the LP tokens into convex. That is another complex protocol that then takes your tokens and gives you more yield. Uh, if you do that on your own, right now you will spend $200, $300 just doing those operations on Ethereum and pay for the gas. But uh, in one of these investment clubs, if there are 100 people in this investment club, the cost of the operation will be roughly the same, a bit more expensive if a garden does it. But then you divide the cost by 100 people, so then it's, it's going to be a lot cheaper. Then another benefit is that you are kind of crowdsourcing investment ideas from these people that shared like the same similar view, similar thesis, the similar investment preferences. So you get, you get the signal from the market as soon as possible, and then you all act on it together just from one input. Another thing you get is you consolidate all your transactions because you can see the garden as a black box. So instead of you having to do 300 transactions, uh, you just deposit into a garden and you get the garden tokens in exchange that represent your participation in that investment club. And when you exit the opposite, 
you burn the garden tokens and you get back the, the asset you deposited. This is, this can be useful depending on your jurisdictions. And this is not tax advice because instead of having to report 400 different transactions, you don't care what happens inside the garden. You're just entering the, the garden and exiting the garden. So it helps you consolidate also all your transactions in one place. Um, plus another benefit that we offer for experts is I think we are the first platform where we let you create DeFi strategies like Lego blocks using just a UI. So you can deploy strategies that, for example, go to compound, deposit die, then borrow ETH, then uh, put that ETH into, into Lido just with a simple UI UX. And that automatically will create the contract for that, the strategy for that garden. And then the garden the investment club will allocate capital to that strategy. So it's all um, really easy for the user. You just need to have all the expertise about DeFi, know what to do, but mechanically, you only need to use the UI and a few clicks. Another traditional split that's convenient in asset management is to talk about passive versus active. But I'd like to get some nuance here. Where do the Babylon strategies fit? Yes, there is definitely an active, for example, I see this as a range and things like germ that are totally passive for the most part, although inside they do things to optimize. Um, for us, I would say we are, and also depends on the investment club. Some of them, they do strategies that are shorter and they change them more often. And then the creator of a strategy can also cancel it and then create a new one. So it's definitely more in the actively managed camp, although you can have a garden that only does one strategy for the year, so then it's mostly passive. So it kind of allows in both, but I would say it's the frame, the, the time frame is to be at least weeks to months and it can also do years, but it's not for super fast trading, like hours to the minute, this token buy and sell, but it's like asset management, like the quarter, quarter, like funds that report per quarter. I think that's the right rental model. It's like a few weeks at least to, to be able to enjoy uh, the upside. My personal assessment is that passive and active is actually not very clear definition. And it's something that I've discussed with my previous guest, Athanasios Paratharagis from Bloomberg, but it's handy. So I'll probably classify the strategies uh, as systematic. But let's move deeper. And one key aspect is that this is non-custodial. So could you tell us what that means and what that implies in terms of risk for the user? Sure. The, the, this is one of the advantages that this new technology, the blockchain and Ethereum gives us. Uh, we can create things that are non-custodial. That means that there is no entity that is holding all the balances in one place, in one ledger and saying, oh, Ramon has $10 in his account, George has 20 uh, this one basically allows us to communicate with uh, without having it to give it to an escrow or a central party first. So we can all send the money to this smart contract and then the smart contract will uh, coordinate it for us. But I'm the only one that is going to be able to access my $10 and George is the only one that is going to be able to access 20 funds. Then the garden itself can access both to put it only on strategies. And then, but once the strategy end, it comes back to the pot and then Again, based on my share of the garden, I can withdraw whatever profits, if any, for unprincipled was the So how does that translate in terms of risk in practical terms? And what happens if something goes terribly wrong for Babylon, for example? What's the ultimate risk? In crypto, you don't have counterparts in place so much. Uh, for example, if you give your money to this end investment entity and the investment entity fall, here you don't have that risk, but you have many other risks, mostly protocol risk and smart contract risk. For example, if you get hacked, I think that's the biggest one. Um, the cool thing about Babylon is you have every garden where the creator of the garden has some has some abilities to do things, but not as many. For example, then within an investment club, then the creator of each strategy has only powers for that strategy. So there's a lot of isolations and checks and balances. So every part, and if a, the creator of a garden misbehaves, then governance of the full protocol can also change the creator. Uh, so the, the creator cannot, the creator doesn't have access to the people that are in that garden, to the funds or anything. The only thing he can do is like, he can do a bad strategy and then the, the funds can lose money. And it, that, that's the, that's the only bad thing he can do. But definitely I would say protocol risk, smart contract risk, and then Lego risk, because the way Babylon works is by using all the DeFi protocols. So we're to the underlying risk of these protocols. Hey, we're picking mostly blue chips like Compound, Aave, Uniswap. 
start really tested and have been around for a, for a while, they have already billions of dollars in TBL to, to decrease that risk as much as possible. But those are the main, because another, we, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. We have been focused on security from day one because one of, one of my co-founders, he used to be the cybersecurity chief in, and he used to be a VP at Telefonic as well. So since the beginning, we have taken security really strongly. We have done already seven security audits. We do internal security audits. We're taking it seriously. So we are doing our best to make sure this doesn't happen. And even if things happen, uh, the damage is isolated because the, uh, the other thing to understand is every investment club is totally isolated from the other investment clubs. Every investment club is its own contract and it has its own strategies that are also isolated from other strategies and then that's isolated from the protocol. So there are like these layers of, of separation that can ensure that something that, that happens in one investment club doesn't affect all the other parts of Babylon. And yes, I think this is an area that's perhaps poorly understood about DeFi and that we discussed with another guest, Lex Sokolin from Consensus, the company behind MetaMask. So we've spoken about the investors and the managers of the strategy. I'd like to shift towards your role. I mean, the Babylon team, how do you see your role in this ecosystem? The way we see our role is we see ourselves like a multiplayer startup. You know, it's like we're giving this leg to make it really easy to interact with all the rest of DeFi. Because you hear often in DeFi, oh, it's like Lego blocks. It's so easy composable. You can mix some match. But that's not true. It's easily composable at the protocol level. And it's still not that easy because the code of each protocol is really different from, from the other. So we're trying to create this layer of, of abstraction so then people can really mix and match uh, all the powerful primitives that each of different protocol gives you. Like, for example, lending from Compound and Aave, like trading, like AMM from Uniswap, like uh, option balls from Ribbon Finance, like yield farming from Jerome Pico. And then let you compose those. For, for example, you want to take leverage and then enter one of these, or you want to short one token and then uh, use the yield uh, from selling calls or selling puts to, to fund something else. You can do those things. I think we're getting started. And our goal, the cool thing is because we are a protocol, we're also open source soon, like our integrations platform. So then everyone will be able to create integrations and also get paid by doing that and help the protocol. Uh, one important thing to know is uh, the protocol is already decentralized uh, in the sense that uh, we have uh, a governance token that is called Bubble and that controls the treasury of the protocol. Then the, the protocol itself receives fees uh, in the form of 5% performance fees on all the profits from all the strategies in all the investment clubs and then half a percent management fee. And all that goes to the treasury. I mean, the governance token basically controls the treasury, controls uh, the main controller of the application to set up parameters like these fees and other things. And then we also have what we call the clone that is a place to stake this token. And then it has a bunch of mechanics taken from the best of these files to the rules like buybacks, add more liquidity to our, to our pair of Uniswap, uh, add liquidity to our lending and borrowing markets because we have a few schools that is like our own compound. Um, I recommend if everyone wants to learn more to go to the media post about the heart of Babylon because it's a bit complicated. But, um, it's all there. And another thing that strikes me is the level of transparency on the strategies and on Babylon itself. It's something that's strikingly different from traditional asset management. Now, I'm curious, do you get a feeling of who the users are? Is there any insights you can share here? There are a few different kinds of experience. Some of them are the use case that I started before that is for friends and family. And some of these investment clubs are gardens are private, some of them are public, but it's just someone that knows about DeFi or TradFi, but then it's getting into that into crypto and they want to share these opportunities with their friends or the family of the community and they're setting it a, a garden and then they are managing together and hopefully create wealth together. That this is our goal in the end. Um, create reach like $1 billion in wealth created every year. That, that's like our North Star for the future. So that's one group of people. These people that are setting investment clubs for their friends and family or work friends. Or whatever. Then another group of people is the unknown Telegram channels or chats that they can uh, look for. I'll find they can have different investment cases. One of them cannot rise to my tokens early as soon as they get listed and then hopefully 
uh, get the appreciation from them. This is a more higher risk play in general. Then we also have, we're also partnering with some protocols and DAOs so they can create their official garden. Because one really cool thing that we can offer, for example, working with Pico right now, Pico community will have their official garden and then through the investment club, they can create the strategies with the three or four top Pico balls or jars in this case. And then by people investing in the garden, they get like an index exposure. They can create an index exposure of the best Pico strategies. And then on top of that, get the bubble mining rewards because Another thing we didn't mention is like this governance token, we give it to the people that are creating wealth in Babylon. So for people that are running a strategy, depositing capital and creating wealth, then they, they receive mining rewards proportionally. Looking at the bigger picture, asset management, I think is a $70 trillion industry. It's absolutely huge. Do you have a sense of scale in terms of asset management in DeFi today and how big it could become? Yeah, asset management is so massive. Uh, it's like one of the biggest markets in the world, along with derivatives, which I think is in the quadrillions in the fin in finance space. So um, from a macro point of view, I think crypto right now is like 2 trillion. And now it's going to 100x over the next decade. So that would put us at 200 trillion. So that means asset management space is going to help. It's going to be a big chunk of that. So there is definitely a lot of growth in this case. I, I think it's similar to when Jack Bogle uh, created Vanguard and then started like the rise of the passive ETFs. By the way, we see it ourselves as a Vanguard of crypto. That in the end, that's our goal to help people create this. And, and you can call it ETF because you can create something like an ETF using investment club, or you can create something like a hedge fund and they have all this kind of menu for people. So then people can find exactly the, the community, the people or the, the things that they want to invest in and get into that and, you know, we'll have some of them that will be protected. They will be insured. There will be some of them that will be super high risk and crazy. So you have all the options available and then you create your portfolio by mixing a few of them. That is basically what 401 case in the U S you know, they, they force you to actually buy from this 10 or 20. So our goal is uh, with crypto, there will be a lot more flexibility, a lot more availability. So not only people from the US can can reach like these options because uh, you know the number I, I check like the number of options available for Europeans versus the US is like a huge difference, for example, in the, in the options that you can you can put your money in it. because also in Europe it's kind of the pensions work totally different. Like in the US it's totally private and you need to invest yourself. Like in the in Europe it's basically usually the government, but all the governments are kind of in have a huge debt problem, so pensions can be at risk in two decades, three decades. So I think in the end, we need to give tools to empower people and help them reach financial freedom. And that's my goal. I want to help as many people as possible reach financial freedom so then we can have a better world. Yes, this sounds quite prophetic and it's perfect and it's and it fits perfectly with a general theme of the podcast, which is the future of investing to generate how, and how to generate better outcomes for investors. So normally I'm the one who's bringing Vanguard into the conversation because I'm a fan and I talk to it with a lot of my guests. But how is it a reference for you? Sure. And an insight there also that I think is important, although it's not related, uh, directly related to crypto, it's like... When Vanguard started, asset management looked really different because it was basically all active. Today, the world looks totally different because most of asset management right now is passive. And that's why you see all these distortions in the market with Tesla and stuff, because basically at the end of the month, whatever grows, the, these, these passive vehicles are forced to buy it and whatever goes down, they force to sell it because it's, it's weighted by market cap. So there are a lot of distortions. And I think, I think there is going to be a renaissance of active management because the market is so distorted and we're going to go through a, through a lot of crisis in the next 10 years. So I think active management is going to, it's going to come back because I think passive works really well with most of the, when most of the market is active, but it's most of the market is Vanguard and BlackRock buying things, then you lose kind of all the signal of the market. I think active management is going to come back in the next 10 years. Okay, I think this is something that I have to disagree on. I don't think passive is distorting the market. I don't think passive is distorting is I don't think passive is distorting the market in any way or that active is making a comeback. 
but I'm going to leave this debate for another time as I have more questions here about DeFi and the future of investing. Uh, so going back to Babylon, where does it fit from a regulatory perspective and what are some regulations that apply? We see ourselves as software providers. So then we give the tools to people so they can create their own investment clubs. And then if depending on their jurisdiction, they may have to set up, for example, another legal entity of the real world tied to that investment club on chain. And they can do that. From our point of view, we are the project protocol is totally decentralized. We give all the tools for everyone to, to be able to create these invest, this DeFi investment clubs. And then it's up to them to make the decisions. So, oh, we want to set up this company in the Cayman Islands, or we want to set up this foundation in Switzerland to kind of handle if they need to do some real world stuff. Depends where the people that are running the club are based, basically. I think there's a rule of maximum 100 people in the US for investment club and other rules in our country. So now let's move on to your outlook. What are some strategies or development development in the space that you are most excited about? Yep. Yeah. First of all, to, to get a bit of context right now, we're still in private beta. We plan, well, uh, we plan to release publicly by the end of this month or in two, three weeks. So we're almost there. We have a 20 million in deposits by this point and around uh, 90 investment clubs have been created uh, with Babylon and more than a thousand people have deposited um, in Babylon. Fine. And then for the future, our plans for this year are going to be mostly irrigate new integrations so people can create new strategies in DeFi. One of the ones that I'm excited about that are soon is re Ribbon Finance and then also going to layer two. So then again, we, we expand the um, the opportunities available for these investment clubs and we also reduce even further oh. the the cost for users and the bar of how much principle you need to have to make it worth it. Because even, I think we already do a lot of gas savings and stuff for the user, but it still doesn't make sense to invest with you. You're going to invest less than $2,000, let's say, on one investment club because that's the cost of, of Ethereum this day. But uh, if we are on Optimism or we are on Arbitrum, we can bring that down or it the next. So then people can also test it because this layer two will be like a really good test bed. So if you want to try Babylon, just invest $100, $200, test it. And then if you want to graduate to the main layer, that I think is where still most of the big gardens would be because you want the biggest security for this kind of investment clubs it, whenever you reach enough capital. Uh, but then you can... Yes, and there's the merge with a capital M, which is the Ethereum merge coming soon. And that could change things. And would you also consider different networks, uh, perhaps Solana, perhaps something else down the road? Ideally, we'd like to be everywhere, but unfortunately, technically, it's quite <laughs> difficult to, especially Solana, because it's just a totally different architecture. Uh, something like Avalanche, for example, would be a lot easier, or Phantom, because it's mostly the same architecture, if you So. It can, but first we'll focus on Ethereum and layer two on Ethereum, like Arbitrum and Optimism, and then probably EVM compatible chains like Phantom and Avalanche. So that's like our roadmap that you can see on our docs, by the way, Recovery. Yes, I can see there are so many possibilities, but let's not forget that you're still very, very early and you've achieved a lot already. The assets, the strategies, it feels a lot more mature than a lot of projects and congratulations on your achievements so far. I always finish with some personal question. And the first one is, what would you do if you were to choose an alternative career path? Alternative career path were something that I always like is, because I like traveling a lot and I, I could have liked being a professional tennis player. I think I like, I like tennis quite a bit. And then I love traveling, so being a professional tennis player was always on my night play now, but not at the same level. Wow. And that's another thing that I'm very interested in is high performance at an advanced age like Kelly Slater, winning a surf championship at 50. Uh, so it's never too late. But let's move on with the last question. How do you invest personally? Personally, it has changed quite a bit in the last few years because so during the time I was researching the traditional funds to before starting Babylon, 
I learned a lot about, you know, how the repo market works, how bonds work, how treasuries work, how ETFs work, and then has given me a, a much better foundation to tackle uh, my personal finance. What I do right now is I have, uh, I'm like Paul, irresponsibly loan in crypto because I believe what is what the most growth is going to be. Then I still hold some bars to hedge uh, crypto and have more stability. For example, I have around 5 to 10% of my portfolio in loan volatility. And what loan volatility means is it's like outside of the money calls and puts to hedge against different market events. And I also have a bit in a, in a volatility fund that they are managing for me. And then I have a still a bit in, in ETFs, in bankers, but it's really tiny. I would say most of it is in my, is in, is in crypto in different ways of form because it's like farther out the risk curves, you know, from Bitcoin to, I don't know, to the crazy token that was created yesterday. So I don't. I think you should position accordingly and it's, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum should be the biggest part of all your portfolio. And then as you go further, the risk curve, then decrease the, the amount that you are investing in this, in this thing. And then I have a little bit on precious metals as well, because I think gold in this environment, like crypto can do really well, especially now that it has been suppressed for the last few years. And now that, for example, what happened with Russia, that uh, the U S taking all the money of, of the head. Of the whole country, I think other countries are going to realize that they probably want to decrease their exposure to treasuries and maybe increase their exposure to something that is more neutral, that they cannot, it cannot be taken away from them. So I think gold, because traditionally central banks like gold, they would probably increase the exposure, not investment advice. Yeah. Of course, we don't do investment advice on this podcast. It's just about sharing some people's experience in order to understand and inspire others. Uh, in order to inspire others. Ramon, thank you so much. Thank you, George. It's been a pleasure.